gaming devices named after big cats, a necessity for gracious living. The jump in technology and graphical processing power between the 4th and 5th generations of game consoles was a huge one, possibly the biggest we've ever seen. And while the early to mid 90s saw some of the more established brands wait patiently for the right time to release their next gen systems, there were a couple of companies that were determined to jump the gun and bring their consoles out ahead of the competition. One such company was the once mighty Atari, which brought out a system that made big, bold claims, but ended up being so underpowered that it far more closely resembled the 16-bit consoles that it was meant to be replacing rather than the 32-bit systems it was supposedly from the same generation as. The former industry giants turned industry punchlines had given us a piece of hardware that was neither fourth nor fifth generation, resulting in a game console that is mostly remembered as a bit of a laughing stock. That's right folks, today we're going to be looking at Atari's deceptive little misfit piece of hardware that just didn't really fit in anywhere, as is often discussed online for all the wrong reasons. So without further ado, I am Lady Decade and this is the embarrassing demise of the Atari Jaguar. If you're under the age of around 40, you could be forgiven for not being aware of Atari's former status as kings of the industry. Before the infamous American console game crash of 1983 and the subsequent release of Nintendo's all-conquering behemoth, the NES in North America. Atari ruled the US home console market with their incredibly enduring video computer system, which was later rebranded to the far more commonly known name of Atari 2600. Also often referred to as that wooden looking thing that granddad used to play. Released in 1977, the VCS was an entertainment phenomenon for kids and families of the late 70s and early 80s, and ended up outlasting the Atari 5200, which was meant to be its replacement. The 2600 was so popular and had such a huge install base that it wasn't even officially discontinued until the 1st of January 1992, which was the exact same date as the 5200's successor, the 7800 was also discontinued. So the stubborn old wood grain box just outright refused to die and essentially outlived both of its successors. Although the 2600 was undeniably etched into the fabric of pop culture, this could also be somewhat attributed to the fact that both the 5200 and 7800 were huge disappointments for Atari. Neither came close to matching a fraction of the success of the 2600, and the 5800, which was intended to rival the NES, did nothing to usurp Nintendo from its position on top of the American gaming food chain. Listen up Atari, the future is here old man! Although they were still relatively respected in the home computer market due to their successful line of 8-bit family systems, the Atari ST and its successor, the impressive for the time, STE, two consoles that were generally considered to be two failures in a row, meant that the Atari brand no longer carried the weight it once did in the home console market. This was also evident by the rather underwhelming response to their first foray into the handheld market in the form of the Atari Lynx. Although the chunky little thing was technologically impressive, with far better specs than all of its portable competitors and generally played and performed pretty well, sales were far lower than projected. 
It wasn't an abject failure by any means, but the financial situation at Atari during this period wasn't great, and the lukewarm reception to the Lynx didn't help matters at all. Jack Trammell and his son Sam, the heads of the once invincible seeming company, surmised that Atari's future was in the… well, in the future, and the best way for them to get back to their winning ways and to the very top of the video game industry was to focus on the next generation of technology and get the jump on Sega and Nintendo before they even thought about upgrading their respective 16-bit systems. After all, a more powerful system is all it needs to take over the gaming world, because that always works, doesn't it? Atari started moving forward on their next generation project as early as 1989 when they saw an opportunity to team up with a British computer hardware company based out of Cambridge known as Flair Technology. Flair was founded in 1986 by Martin Brennan, Ben Cheese and John Matheson who were all former engineers at Sinclair. This would lead to the Atari Panther being developed, a cancelled game console from Atari that has a backstory behind it that is so convoluted that it would require a standalone video on this channel to fully comprehend. Despite the Panther being close to ready for launch by mid-1991, the Panther would be cancelled altogether in favour of the more powerful Jaguar. Atari felt that the Jaguar's hardware would give them a clear and decisive edge over Nintendo and Sega and lead them to victory in the console wars. Much celebration and rejoicing and the fairy tale happy ending they so craved. Poor Atari, they didn't even know what was coming, did they? The Jaguar's impressive seeming hardware has five processors spread across three chips. Tom, a 32-bit RISC graphical processing unit, Jerry, a similar 32-bit RISC processor that used to provide full stereo sound, and a Motorola 68000, used mainly as a system manager. I really can't tell you why, but naming those Tom and Jerry really reminds me of Roman Reigns having to do that suffering succotash gimmick. Okay. The Jaguar also had an impressive 64-bit memory bus under its hood, which could transfer a staggering 106.4 megabytes per second. Well, it was pretty staggering in late 1991 anyway. It was the combination of the two 32-bit RISC processors as well as the admittedly impressive memory bus that led to Atari giving us what the Jaguar is probably known for best, its bit count. Now we've been through just how silly and how much of a marketing ploy the fatuous bit wars of the late 80s and 90s were on this channel before, but Atari took things to a whole new level with the Jaguar. Not only did they claim that it was a 64-bit console, they pretty much based their entire branding and marketing campaign around this incredibly dubious fact. The only thing that could be legitimately considered truly 64-bit within the system's hardware is the memory bus. And what use is a 64-bit transferal system if you're only using 32-bit processors? Make it make sense! Calling the Jaguar a 64-bit console is at best a clever and misleading use of semantics and at worst, an intentional deceptive ploy to attempt to con the naive public. It seems rather silly in retrospect that consumers could be whipped into such a frenzy with some simple use of multiples of eight and the word bit. But it really was a simpler time back then. A simpler, stupider time. The Jaguar was first unveiled to the unsuspecting public in August 
1993 at the Consumer Entertainment Show in Chicago and was released in limited numbers to American test markets in New York and San Francisco three months later on the 23rd of November for $249.99. A full nationwide launch came a few months after that in early 1994. Atari had secured a $500 million deal with IBM to manufacture the physical hardware in an attempt to make it seem like the Jaguar was a homegrown American console, despite most of its roots coming from right here in jolly old England. The Atari Jaguar was as British as tea and crumpets. I told you it was a deceptive little thing, didn't I? Even though on paper, Atari seemed to be being incredibly forward-thinking with the development of their latest bit of kit. The intervening two years between the concept and release had seen Sega bring out their Mega Drive add-on, the Mega CD, while Commodore had just launched their Amiga CD32 device in Europe. To compound matters further, an entirely new upstart company led by gaming's dreamiest hunk, Trip Hawkins, known as 3DO, had joined the party and brought out a vastly superior machine tech-wise just over a month and a half before the Jaguar launched. Can anything go right for the calamitous Atari company? Atari has planned to give the public a technological powerhouse, but their new console was starting to look woefully underpowered before it was even released. One thing Atari did have on their side was affordability. Despite the system retailing for $50 more than its predicted $199.99 launch price, the Jaguar was still $100 cheaper than the CD32 and around a third of the price of 3DO's high-end big budget beast. The Jaguar's launch was accompanied by a memorable ad campaign that heavily featured the slogan, You do the math, in reference to the system's bold 64-bit claims. It's those adverts we've all no doubt seen countless times, with the annoying teacher lady yelling at us from a classroom about how much we should care about bits. Part of me feels that a lot of teachers could get into a lot of trouble for saying stuff like that these days. A memorable piece of marketing for sure, but there was one major problem, and that was that video game consumers generally had eyes, and they usually used them for looking. Anyone with 2020 vision could see that Atari's latest console's big talk of having more bits than all of the competition just didn't translate in the graphics department. Truth be told, it seemed to look far less graphically impressive than most of the other 32-bit systems it was meant to be outshining. This was very apparent in the Jaguar's launch game, Cybermorph, which featured the debut of everyone's least favourite bald, mouthy, disembodied green head. Where did you learn to fly? Perhaps a more appropriate question would be, where did you learn to program games? Given the absolutely atrocious draw distance on display here, Bear in mind that this was a pack-in launch title, something that should be specifically trying to show off the capabilities of the system. I mean, granted, there are polygons on display and it is in 3D, but the game is almost unplayable and that stupid green trollop constantly in your ear doesn't exactly help matters. To put it in context, the similar looking but far, far more playable Star Fox had come out on the 16-bit Super Nintendo eight months before Cybermorph was released. It was a little bit embarrassing really, and that bombastic do the math ad campaign had backfired massively, as people were starting to feel as if Atari was trying 
to hoodwink them and early Jaguar buyers were left feeling sorely disappointed after the vague promises about the system's prowess that had been made to them. Where did you learn to fly? 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 The Jaguar's awkward and often buggy hardware was also proving a headache for developers. Thanks in part to the rushed development cycle the troubled console was put through. Atari pushed hard to have the prototype hardware ready by the end of 1991, so it was ready for product testing in 1992, which resulted in the custom chip design between the console's three main processors being left somewhat incomplete. A huge roster of almost 200 development companies was promised when the system launched, but when they realised just what they were dealing with, the vast majority of them simply dropped out. Yikes. As one would expect, this resulted in a lack of of games, with most of the ones that did get released proving incredibly underwhelming. Aside from the odd standout titles such as Rayman or the super cool Alien vs Predator, many were left struggling to see much improvement on what we were used to seeing in the previous 16-bit console generation. Given that we were being encouraged to do the math, would it not stand to reason that we should expect Jaguar games to look four times better? It's no wonder that most of the console's games were indistinguishable from their 16-bit counterparts, and that's essentially what a lot of them were. Most programmers did not have the time nor the patience to faff about with two semi-broke custom processors that they were entirely unfamiliar with, so instead they would opt to use the familiar 16-bit Motorola 68000, thus bypassing the hardware's 32-bit chips entirely. By the way, did I mention that this console is deceptive? All the bad press, consumer dissatisfaction and lack of compelling software meant the Jaguar struggled to get any kind of significant install base, and by the end of 1994, Atari had only managed to sell a worrying 100,000 units. Things were looking bleak, but they were about to get a whole lot bleaker. This brings us to the summer of 1995, one of the most exciting times in history for gamers, but one of the most depressing times in history for Atari. The launch of the Sega Saturn in May and the Sony PlayStation in September meant that the Jaguar was not only increasingly underpowered, but was also becoming borderline irrelevant. Both consoles made Atari's ugly little box look almost primitive in comparison. This would cause Sam Trammell to go into damage control mode in an infamous 1995 interview with Next Generation magazine, in which he claimed the Jaguar was at least as powerful as the Saturn, and only slightly less powerful than the PlayStation. The cheeky deluded little scamp. The interview ended up getting a deluge of complaints after he made some rather curious claims about suing Sony over the price of their upcoming PlayStation. He also further angered his customers when he stated that the lack of third-party developers was actually good for the Jaguar's profitability, despite it meaning that consumers had barely any games to choose from. I'm going to have to bring the word nitwit back for you, Sam Trammell, you absolute nitwit you. Atari slashed the prices of their albatross of a console by $100 in an attempt to stay afloat, but it helped about as much as one would expect, i.e. not a fat lot. 
a rather damning excerpt from Atari's 1995 annual financial report reads, Jaguar sales were substantially below Atari's expectations, and financial results were materially adversely affected. The shaky financial ground that Atari was already on before the Jaguar was even released meant that they simply could not dedicate the level of marketing that is historically required to ensure a video game console's success. The development and release of Atari's divisive system was a huge gamble in almost all conceivable ways. And it was a gamble that wasn't really paying off. By late 1995, Atari was left with little recourse, and their ailing console that had started with so much potential was quickly turning into a complete disaster. The Jaguar had turned Atari into a laughing stock, so to say the Jaguar had been a failure so far would be a bit of an understatement. The platform was panning out to be an embarrassment that amused critics, angered consumers, and was killing off one of the most recognisable and beloved brands in gaming history. Still, there was one last ditch attempt to save the system. But that's a story for next time. So I am Lady Decade, and that was the terrible demise of the Atari Jaguar. So if you enjoyed this video, then like, subscribe and comment and all of the usual stuff that people ask you to do at the ends of their videos, which also includes getting my face tattooed on your bum and then sending me a picture to prove that it happened because if there's not a picture, it didn't happen. So before I go and answer one of the questions from one of my lovely patrons, I'd like to be, give a big shout out to Quang from Asobitech, who was kind enough to lend me a small selection of consoles from his huge, huge, huge collection. Now Quang quite possibly has the largest collection of individual consoles, I'm pretty sure in England, quite possibly Europe, quite possibly the world and he is also an indie game developer um, currently working on a game called Defused on the Game Boy so well Game Boy Color to be exact so I'd also like to answer a question from one of my patrons who is currently here in my live studio audience over on Twitch so hello to my live studio audience on Twitch and Atticris has today asked, is there a game you've really been meaning to play but still not quite got around to? And for me, the answer to that, to that would be, initially I was just going to say Terranigma, but as you know, Terranigma is part of the Quintet series, which includes Soul Blazer and Illusion of Time. And these are games that I keep meaning to play and then never quite get around to doing. So that is something that I really, really will, at some point, actually get them out and play rather than just leave them on the shelf. So if you would like to have your question answered at the end of one of my videos, then please consider backing this channel over on Patreon. And if you enjoyed this video, thank you very much for sticking around until this point, and I shall see you next time.